video before we jump into our teaching time. <laughs> Let it out, son. It's the beginning of wisdom. Who are you? I'm God. Uh, yeah. And I want you, Evan Baxter, to build an ark. Building an ark is really not part of my plans here. No, 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 no. Take what? I need to make a good impression at work. Gentlemen. Yeah. Good to see you. You look like a bum in a suit. Oh. Are you starting a Bee Gees tribute band? Duh, you gotta go shave. I can't shave. Whenever I shave, the beard grows right back in. <gasps> That's what happens when you shave. But then you shave again. Oh, Don't worry, help is on the way. And if anybody asks, tell them flood's coming. You want to build a boat? It might be something fun for the family. Go, go! Go sailing on the lake? I don't know. Be great in case it floods or something. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Foreman. I'm the lead pastor here. So glad you're here today. And uh, that clip that you just saw was from a movie called, some of you know it, Evan Almighty, right, where God asked Evan to build an ark because a flood was coming. And I use that this morning as a wave introduction because how many of you can guess who we're going to talk about today? We are going to talk about, no, y'all are very smart, and uh, he actually was the guy that God did ask to build an ark because a flood was actually coming, and uh, it's likely a story that you are very familiar with. Uh, most people uh, have either grown up, known it a little bit, if they've been around the Bible a little bit, but uh, in case you don't, uh, we'll give you, get you in all the details today. But, uh, but today, we're not going to really look at the actual flood side of the story. We are going to look at the very end of the story, actually when the flood is coming to an end. And ultimately, um, the altar that Noah builds in response of getting off of the ark. Um, if you've been around this summer, you know we're in our summer message series called Altars, A Place of Sacred Encounters. And what we're doing is we're looking at Old Testament stories where altars were built. Uh, where there will be a phrase, it'll be, and, and there he built an altar to the Lord, or, or he built an altar, or, there an altar of the Lord was built, those kind of things. And, and these, uh, not just about the altars themselves, but these altars where they were built, and the person who was building them, there was this sacred encounter that they had with God, the creator of the universe. And uh, what we're trying to do is um, make, uh, look at these and kind of say, like, maybe, can we have more of those sacred encounters ourselves? Um, what can we learn from these sacred encounters? Because in those moments, they got real with God, tan like really vulnerable with God, like God was tangible to them. And so we want to make our life an altar to the Lord. So today we're going to be reading and talking about Noah's altar. That's our title this morning, which actually kind of cool is the very first altar we see in the scripture. Uh, so we're looking at numero uno today. If you want to grab a Bible, you can turn to Genesis chapter 8. That's where we're going to land today. Uh, if you don't have a paper Bible and you'd like to use one, there are paper Bibles about every other seat or so uh, in the seats in front of you. Or you can simply go to sermons.church on a browser on your smart device. Search Cornerstone Church and all the scriptures will be there for you along with our interactive message notes uh, this morning. And so we're going to jump in. And uh, before we do, though, in chapter 8... Um, just to get a little bit of context, so this, at this point when we're jumping in, uh, it has rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The flood has taken place, okay? Um, and Noah and his wife and his sons and his sons' wives uh, and all the animals, they're in the ark and they're just kind of riding out the storm, all right? Quite literally. And so we're going to look at verse 1 of chapter 8, kind of jump around a little bit. We're reading a lot today, so stick with me as best you can. Okay, verse 1 says this. It says, but God... Remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him, with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the eight, uh, 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven, and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could, not find, could find nowhere to perch because there was water all over the surface of the earth. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there was a, in its beak a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's six hundred and first year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. 
But the 27th day, by the 27th day, the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Skip to verse 18. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. Verse 20, this is kind of our crux of why we're looking at this in this uh, series. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So I know it's quite lengthy text there, but I think some good uh, things for us to kind of process through and look through today as we look at Noah's altar that he built to the Lord. Um, but before we go any deeper, I want to pause and pray. So if you would pray with me, and then I'll give you a couple things to write down and think about. So let's pray together. So God, we pause for a moment and just, uh, we're just grateful that we've gotten to be together this morning uh, in your presence to worship you and to give you honor and praise. And um, God, it's just been a privilege already. And so we just want to continue meeting with you uh, in this process as we look at this text, that we look at this story and this altar of Noah, uh, that God, that you would do something supernatural in us as a result of our time, not because of what I'm sharing, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that would get just, God, would just speak to our hearts and our souls. God, that we would maybe uh, have something when we leave here that we didn't have when we came, or maybe we'd just be reminded of something. God, that we would just be different. We, we don't want to waste this time this morning. So come Holy Spirit, we pray. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, we have two points today. Here's your first one. You can write this in as we look at Noah's altar. Noah's altar teaches us, number one, the value of watching and waiting. Noah's altar teaches us the value of watching. We're going to let uh, sit here for just a few minutes this morning. Um, I almost thought about writing it this way, like uh, Noah's altar teaches us the value of letting things play out. I almost did it that way, uh, which we actually see honestly throughout this entire text. Um, I was just thinking, you know, most uh, a good chunk of people assume that the flood, because of the way that you read the scripture, uh, flood only lasted for 40 days and 40 nights that I uh, mentioned just a minute ago. But the Bible actually tells us when all is said and done, Noah and his family and all of the animals were in the ark a total of 371 days. Over a year. A really long time. That was a really, really long time, right? Now, uh, 371 days. Now, I don't have time to mathematically do uh, lay this all out for you today, but throughout the text that we just read, uh, there are all sorts of references. You probably caught them when we kind of maybe even got confused when I was reading it, but there's all kind of references to specific numbers and days and days of the month. And if you do the calculations, right, which I will admit gets a little bit confusing here or there, and if you're interested, I can share with you all the details of what it looks like because I actually did it. I actually went through and did all the calculations this week, okay? Um, but if you do the calculations, it all comes down and comes out to 371 days. And for the sake of the moment, just trust me if you would, because we really don't have time to walk through all the mathematical. I actually went through that uh, during the run through on Thursday, and my wife's like, you can't do that. Um, so she told me no. So like, I will share with you, if you are interested in all of that, I can share with you all the calculations, okay? But just trust me in the midst of this for the moment, all right? But we are going to look at a couple verses, okay? It, um, the, the truth is, is that it did actually pour rained for 40 days and 40 nights. We know this because Genesis 7, 4, which is just before our text we read, says that it was going to do that. God says this. He said, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So, by the way, God does what he says, okay? So God said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. He did. It did. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. After that, it actually rained an additional kind of lightly for uh, 110 days. And we know this because, right, it says in verse 24 that the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. So if you take 150 minus 40, that equals 110. Y'all didn't know you were coming to do a math lesson this morning, right? All right, so all that to say, right, we know at first it's 150 days, okay? Now, the scripture then goes on and gives us the following numbers. And I don't have time to lay this all out for you. So we've got to start with 150, okay? Then the scripture tells us that there were 74 days for the water to decrease, okay? And then there were another 40 days, and then Noah sends out a raven, okay? Uh, and then he sends out a dove seven days later, okay? He does it a second time seven days later. He actually does it a third time seven days later. 29 days then go by, and Noah removes the uh, covering from the ark, Okay, and then 57 more days, he and his family walk off the ark. 
And so in summary, as these figures are all added up, actually, I want you to do me a favor. Get your phone out right now. Get your phone, get your, phone, get your calculator out. Get your, and I want you to do that. I want to, I want, I'm not lying to you. I want to make sure that you know this is true. Okay, I want you to add all those numbers up. 150 plus 74 plus 40 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 29 plus 57 equals, bring it up, 371 days. 371 days. I actually didn't know uh, this. I should have done the math. I actually had somebody give me uh, text this to me uh, first. Ever. So that means that is five, 534,240 minutes. That is 32,054,400 seconds. That's a long time. That is a long time to be on an arc. And so here's the, here's the reality, folks. This would not have been easy. I know some people are like, well, he's on a boat. It's like a carnival cruise, right? How many of you know this way ain't no carnival cruise, right? I mean, first of all, there's a bunch of stinky animals, okay? I know some of you are animal lover. I am not an animal lover, so I would not have been happy on this boat, okay? But it is, it's, I'm sure that it's stunk and the noise, right? And then, not only that, that's like the animal side of things, but then you got to deal with the people, right? Like, so the, we know that he's there with his wife and his sons and his son's wife. Um, I thought about it like this. Do you guys remember COVID? <laughs> and like when we were quarantined, and though you love the people that you were quarantined with, that they started to drive you freaking nuts, right? Like you were thinking, maybe you should go live in the shed, you know, those kinds of things. I was just thinking this week about like, like man, like I'm, I'm like I know I guarantee that at some point, right? Like, like Noah's getting frustrated with his wife, and his wife's getting frustrated with him, and he's getting frustrated with his sons, and she's getting frustrated with the sons, and his wives. Maybe they're all arguing. Like this would not have been easy. This was no carnival cruise for 371 days. Like, I'm thinking, uh, I, don't, I don't do cruises because I get claustrophobic and there ain't no way. Like, like I would have been like notching the wood and like waiting to get off this boat, right? This would have been really hard. And so as I was studying this week, I was thinking, so what does this teach us? If, if he's really on this boat with his family and all these animals for 370, what does this teach us? And folks, I think that what, what the point, again, I'll go back to is that I think what the Noah teaches us in this moment is the value of watching and waiting, there's great value, like letting things play. And he does it beautifully here this, this, in this, in this uh, account of Noah, right? He, he was patient and, and overly patient, right? Um, though, again, I'm sure there were days that were hard and frustrating. He probably didn't sleep really well. And th- I'm sure that the boat was not easy. It was rocking all over the place. And, and so there, was, there were rough days. But what we see is that he's just patient to go, okay, Lord, what do you got next? All right, hey. And like even like the dove thing, like he did the dove thing and then seven more days, dove thing and then a dove thing. How many of that would have taken his patience? Like, come on, God. Right? You all awake this morning? You, you, you catching this, right? Like this would have been really, really hard. And see, he, he shows us the value of being patient. And, and likely because he was the head of his household in the way that culturally this worked out, he probably would have had to been the strong one. To, if they would have all, like, if they were having bad days, he couldn't really have a bad day because he had to be, he had to show patience so that he could uh, help them see patience in themselves and in their situation for his wife and his sons. And, and, then, and then I think about this, like, you know, like, uh, many of you know this, that, like, uh, patience is actually a fruit of the Spirit, right? It says in Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and everybody say it with me, patience, right? Patience, a part of walking out life and, and doing life with God is a willingness, if I can say it this way, is a willingness, listen to me, this is a different than just patience, is a willingness to give God room to work. Let me say that again. If we're going to actually do life the way we're supposed to and the way that we're supposed to with God, folks, we have to be willing to give God room to work. How many know this can be really hard? It can be really hard. Because what that means is that we have to be slow. And not only be slow, but be okay with slow. And some of you are thinking, yeah, that's really hard for you, Matt, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's very hard for me because I'm kind of like the squirrel kind of guy, right? Like squirrel, right? I'm like this high energy, all the kind of, so it's really hard for me to be slow and be okay with slow. It's actually the reason why I hate playing games like Settlers of Catan or Monopoly. (laughs) 
Some of you may love those games, but I cannot. I am an instant reaction kind of person. You, you have like 20 minutes of my time. We better get to the start and the finish of a game in about 20 minutes or I'm done. Okay? And then like this whole like there's this brick and wheat and what I don't even understand the whole game of the settlers. It's weird and I just can't do it. And, and, and I, I just because mostly because it's just it takes way too long. It's hard for me to let these games play out. And, and here's my thought is that there, some of you probably agree. There's actually first ever somebody when I said, like, Settlers is a dumb game, somebody said, Amen, you know. Um, and, then, and then when somebody over here was like, I love Settlers, like they were kind of fighting back and forth, kind of like doing a Brandon and I think right here this, this morning. But, but, you know, I know there's probably some of you in the room that you probably like those games, and that's probably fine and whatever. But, but here's my guess. Even though if some of you like that game or those games and, and love playing them, um, I get, uh, my guess is I'm probably not alone in being really bad at waiting and watching. Like some of you in this room, like even if you're good at those games and you like those games, you're probably too, it can be challenging for you to watch and wait to be patient. I, especially when you're in those moments like Noah was, where like, you know, like sometimes it's just, uh, it's just like a menial thing that's, that's a watch and wait thing, but sometimes it's an extremely big thing in our life and there is nothing we can do and we just have to wait on God. And that can be so hard. You've been in those seasons, I bet. Been in those situations every now and then where there's literally nothing you can do and you just have to wait on God. And it can be so excruciatingly hard. And, and I th actually think one of the reasons, and again, we, we see that it was hard for Noah too, but I actually think one of the reasons why it can be so hard for us in 2024, folks, is because of something called hurry sickness. Have you ever heard of hurry sickness? It actually uh, was coined by uh, author and pastor John Mark Comer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Um, if you were here a few weeks ago when Andrew actually taught, he actually mentioned this book as well. But, but uh, he coins this phrase, hurry sickness, and, and he essentially would say that, that hurry sickness is something that we as human beings in 2024 carry all too often and too much of. And, and, and so what happens is because we carry hurry sickness in our life and in our soul and our day to day, he, he, he says basically, essentially, it, it puts our life on this trajectory where I would say this morning as we're looking at Noah, folks, it makes it really hard when we're having hurry sickness in our every day to really, in those times where we're just waiting on the Lord, it makes it excruciating because we don't even have the muscle. And so you're like, okay, well, what does hurry sickness mean, Pastor Matt? Well, let me, let me try to exp explain hurry sickness. The way that John Mark Comer explains hurry sickness is this. He says, uh, for example, like a litmus test, if you have hurry sickness in your life, he would say this. He said, if you would come up to a stoplight, it would be a two-lane stoplight, and you're in this left lane, and the left lane has like 10 cars in it, and the right lane has only two cars in it, if you automatically switch lanes to get to the shorter lane, he would say that you have hurry sickness. Some of you are feeling convicted because you know you do that every time you come to a stoplight. I do, right? I'm like, oh my gosh, why do I do that? Like the, yesterday, I was out driving around, and there was a car, like there was a lane that had like ten cars in it, and, and and I I literally had to stop myself from getting in the right lane, like I, I just automatic. It was like automatic, right? Same is true at like the grocery store. Like uh, we, you know, we we don't we try to find what the shortest line, right? And, and so I was doing that yesterday too. I went to the store and I went to the self checkout lanes and whatever, and they were they were all full. And there was one lady li uh, waiting, and and so I stood there for a second, and then all of a sudden I was like, "Hey, there's these like four over here that are like five items or less," and there was nobody there. So like, of course I went over there, and so I was like, "There was one person to wait for," and I couldn't wait two minutes. I had to go over these other ones. We folks often, so many of us, we the, like those are just two silly examples, but we carry those things, don't we? It's what we do. We carry this hurry sickness, and, and because we carry this hurry sickness in our life, uh, then it, what I'm kind of going to make this connection today, folks, it makes these Noah moments and these Noah seasons pretty unbearable because we're just in a hurry. And so John Mark Comer, his suggestion to, to, uh, to combat hurry sickness is to practice otherwise. Practice otherwise. Meaning, when you come to the stoplight, intentionally say, I am going to stay in the longest lane. I think it's funny that we laugh at that because why, we know ourselves, don't we? We're, it's going to be hard to combat hurry sickness, right? Or he would say, when you go to the grocery store, pick the longest lane. 
pick the longest lane because what happens when you pick the longest lane or you wait in the longest line, folks, what it does is it's like flexing a muscle. And if you've ever worked out, I'm clearly am a bodybuilder, um, so I know all about it. <laughs> but right, like, you know, like, if you, fl- you have to have reps to get the muscle strong. And if you, if you take reps in waiting and watching, intentionally doing in things that are somewhat meaningless, then what's going to happen is that we're going to have the strength to hold on when it's excruciating. Are you catching me this morning? We've got to practice otherwise. I think something to, to consider is like, what are our reps? And like, really, like, w- like, how can we be? And I know sometimes like we are in a hurry and those kind of things. But how many, how many of you know I think sometimes we're in more of a hurry than we we think we're in more of a hurry than we actually are. We can practice it. And so I think uh, it's something that before we get to the altar part of Noah's story here this morning, I think it's important for us to realize that there's, I think we can learn some value that he has, maybe that we need in watching and waiting and letting things play out. And maybe we need to give it a try in the places where we can. I mean, um, when I was... Um, uh, driving around yesterday, like, again, I, I had this line of 10 cars, and I was going like, to, I had to be intentional to not get over. I failed at the grocery store, right? But I will tell you this, uh, and I've done this now a few times, as I've been considering this more in my life, and I need to have more rhythms of, of hur- less hurry and those kind of things in my life. I can tell you, folks, there, it, it, in the moment when I'm doing that, when I'm being intentional with it, it's doing something. I can feel it. I can feel what it's doing in me. And sometimes it's irritation because I just want to go, but I know that I got to get rid of that irritation. And sometimes it's like, I have peace. So it's doing something in me. So I think it's something for us to consider and maybe do, and let's flex this muscle um, that we need to, so we, I mean, it would be great. That might even be a good prayer. Like, Lord, help me get rid of my hurry sickness. Have Lord's help in that. And, and And then I think about like, uh, like, because our call, the call on our life is to to actually wait, and specifically to wait on the Lord. A, a couple of scriptures, waiting on the Lord, which Noah had to do in this situation. It says in Psalm thirty-seven, seven, it says, "Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him." Be still, not in hurry, before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And then the second part I find interesting says, "Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes." Sometimes I think we can focus on uh, what. what what other people are getting and doing and going in the fast pace they have, and the Lord's like, hey, sh- sh- let them do that. Just be still. Wait upon the Lord. Hosea 12, 6 says, but you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and I love this, wait for your God, everybody say it with me, always. I love that. You know when you look up the scripture and, and, and the meaning of, of the word always, it means always? It means always. It means we need to wait upon God always in all things in all of our life. We need to flex this muscle. I think it's a good lesson to take from Noah in this altar story today. The value of uh, really something I know I need to get better at. My guess is most of us really do. Like we might just need to pray. This might be a good prayer. Like, Lord, make us like Noah. Help. Like this is even the, the better part of the prayer. Like, God, help me give you room to work. How many of you know if we could actually focus on that, that phrase, Lord, give me wisdom to give you room to work. If we could focus on giving God room to work, how many of you know we'd probably be more successful in it? Lord, let me give you room to work. That's our point one today. Noah's altar teaches us the value of watching and waiting. I think something to take from that, the fruit of the spirit of the patience, all right? Second thing here, you can fill this in on your handout, really the crux of why we're looking at this today. Noah's altar teaches us to be grateful for God's attention. To be grateful for God's attention. Um, for this point, I want to take us back to the very first verse of the text and then weave that into um, verse 20. It says in verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, But God remembered Noah. I underline that. I took notice of that this week as I was studying. But God remembered Noah, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. And then verse 20 says, after that, then he built an altar to the Lord. Of course, this was after they got off the ark and those kind of things. But God remembered Noah and sent a wind on the earth, and the waters receded, and then he built the altar. And so really, what we see here in this text is that Noah built an altar of gratitude. 
He built an altar of gratitude. Maybe also maybe of a little bit of relief, a sense of relief, right? They were spared. It was over. And, and I think that, that we've we got to understand that this is really what this altar was truly about, that, that, that Noah was being grateful to God, showing gratitude to God for, for his uh, the ability, that he, the fact that he valued God, uh, God's attention to his fam- him and his family. The, the fact that, which is like, a, this is a big deal, and I think it'd be easy to gloss over this, but folks, this is a big deal that in, in this story that Noah gets the attention of the God of the universe. The creator of the universe, the all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty God cares for Noah and his family through this entire process and really always. Incredible. And something to value. And the cool part is, and what I want us to, to catch in the rest of this point is, is the cool part is, is, that, is that this was not just for Noah and his family and, and him and, and this guy in this time and this place and all that. This, folks, this is for you and me as well. And is also incredible. It says in Deuteronomy 31, 8, that the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. You see, God went before and with and, and remembered Noah, cared for him, never leaving. He was there. And the beauty is the Bible tells us that he, God, is and does the same with us. He remembers us. He cares for us. He never leaves us. He's always there. It's mind-blowing in some senses that the God of the universe would know Matt Porman, some bald head freak pastor guy in Indiana. Somebody said Amen. <laughs> but take a second and think about that. That the creator of the universe knows Jim and Bob and Jack. Incredible. That is an incredible thing that the God who created all things and all power and almighty, that he knows me and he knows you. Incredible. And here's the other part of the fact that it's incredible. Not only that he knows, the, the fact that he knows us and wants to be in relationship with us, even though we give him every reason to quit on us. You and I give him every reason to quit on us. We go back to, to, to the text that says that the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma of the, of the sacrifices Noah was making. And he said in his heart, this God says, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. And then here it is. Even though every inclination of the human fart, oh, fart. <laughs> that's really funny. Scratch that. Even, and we're recording this service, of course. Okay. <laughs> Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Romans 3.10 says, there's no one good, not even one. Folks, you know, he, th- this, this is incredible because we give him every reason. We give God every reason to quit on us and, 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 and call it quits on us because we keep constantly pursuing and pressing into into sin and the evil of this world, things that absolutely would go against what he would desire for us. Not chasing his goodness, and yet he sticks around. He says in that that Deuteronomy, he will never leave. And I said earlier that God does what he says. God will never leave. And, and it's incredible because he says that he'll never leave, so we believe that he's never going to leave, and he will never leave, even though we give him every reason to leave. Thinking about uh, Psalm 8, verse 4, the psalmist asks a, asks a great question to God. He asks God, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them? That you, God would stick around, continuing to be for us and believing in us, getting, believing we can, we can get and be better, be your people, that we would indeed chase you, even though, God, we say we're going to chase you, and yet we often chase, our, chase the things that we desire and we want in our lives, that we say things, and, and that, that you, you continue to believe that we're going to do it, we're going to show up, and that you can be all that you want to be, God, you want to be our God, and we keep making ourselves our God, or, or different things of this world our God, and you keep sticking by us, oh God, what is human beings that you are mindful of us? And how many of you know that Noah... Though we are told in, uh, I believe, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, that Noah was righteous. It says that Noah was a righteous man, blameless and among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Even though we are told that he was righteous, how many of you know he still screwed up? 
right? He still was going to mess up. He, shoot, he was human, right? He was going to say something or do something or think something or not do something that was against God. He too had a human heart that was and is evil from childhood, like we read in that text just a minute ago. And yet God believed in Noah. As a human being believed that, okay, I, I can at least try with Noah, and then from there on out, I can try with the rest of humanity. Because he says, moving forward, that he's not going to do this again. It says again, just a reminder in verse 21, never again will I cur curse the ground because of humans. Never again will I destroy all living creatures I, as I have done. This, is, by the way, is where the whole rainbow thing comes in, the co covenant between God and humanity. In verse 9, 13 of the book of Genesis, it says, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and will be... It'll be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And so Noah realized all that God had done here to this end, overall in his life, and specifically those 371 days in the ark. And so he builds an altar of gratitude, of relief, of thankfulness to God. And what I want us to try to catch today, folks, is that like Noah, also be grateful. Be grateful. Be grateful that God has attention and he gives it to you and to me. We have, if you don't know this, you, I, and I know you might have a, a really rough situation going on in your life. You, you might, uh, like, things may have really gone awry this week, but I will tell you, I know for a fact that you also have today, in this moment, so much to be grateful for. And I don't even know what your situation, I don't know what your week was like, but, and I'm going to prove it to you here in a minute. You and I have so much to be grateful for. Um, I thought this week of, um, I was thinking about, uh, like, if we transition this whole, like, and, you know, of course, Noah, it's like these 371 days, God spared him, all this kind of stuff, whatever. But I was thinking as we transition this to us, I was thinking of a couple of scriptures that almost became kind of categories of God's attention to you and me, that no matter what we're going through, we have God's attention in these things, and uh, that we should be grateful for. And uh, they're actually going to be on your handout. You can fill them in. The first uh, was that we, we folks, we can be grateful that God provides for our needs. He provides for our needs. In the book of uh, Matthew, I was thinking about a story that we um, can read where Jesus, uh, there's a large crowd that have followed Jesus. By the way, this is right after he hears that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded, and so he's emotional, going through a tough time, like some of us have gone through a tough time maybe this week. And so, um, you know, he, there's this large crowd, and, and it's getting late in the day, and they don't have any food, and to the point it's like, oh, hey, Jesus, the disciples are starting to freak out. They're like, hey, we don't have any food. What are we going to do? we got to send these people away. And Jesus provides for the people. Huge crowd, huge thing. So it says this in verse 17 in Matthew 14. It says, the disciples say, hey, we have here only five loaves and, and two fish. Jesus says, bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all, all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. That's incredible. Remember, they only had five loaves and two fish. How did they get 12 basketfuls? The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women. And children, and I love that story because, folks, the same is true in that moment where Jesus provided more loaves and more bread and, and more fish for them, and the people ate, and there was less, some left over, folks. God provides our needs. Now, he doesn't always provide our wants. I think that's important to understand, but he provides our needs. It says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, he says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I've actually seen this play out in my life. I was just taking a couple minutes this week and going, okay, Lord, how have you provided for my needs? And there's so many things, but I was thinking about how like there have been times in our life where Lee and I were financially tight and then like that check would come at just the right time. Or I was thinking about, you know, how like there have been times in our lives where we would have a need in our life and, and somebody that we were connected to relationally would have extra. And so they would say, hey, like, I know you need this. So, uh, so like, um, you can have this because we have extra. And, and specifically, I was thinking about this last year. My, my uh, daughter, uh, Abby, started driving, and so we needed to get her a car. And, and, uh, and so uh, we have a guy here at the church that was like, hey, I have an extra one. Do you want it? And I was like, nah. No, I'm just kidding. I said, I said yes. Of course I said yes. Right? And so like, he was like, hey, I have this extra car. Do you want it? And so like, again, like those, those situations where it was like the, the Lord just showed up. 
he provided. And, and I think there's, there's so much, and sometimes we have these seasons where we, we don't see the things that we are expecting and those kind of things. But man, can I just tell you, I've seen over and over and over the times where the Lord has provided my need. And because he's provided my need, oh, I should be grateful. And we should be grateful. Secondly, the second thing I thought of, of, of God's attention that we might be grateful for, God gratitude, if is it, I put it on your handout, is for healing. Is for healing. And, and, and I, uh, specifically, not just physical healing, but yeah, so physical healing, emotional healing, relational healing, spiritual healing, just overall healing, that, that God is a healer. We should be grateful. And I thought of the story in Luke chapter 17, verses 12 through 19, which is uh, Jesus' encounter with a few sick people. When it says this, In verse 12, it says, as he, Jesus, was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. That was a skin disease. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Now you understand that Jesus and the Samaritans didn't associate with each other, but this guy pushes back past that and comes and he connects to Jesus and he thanks him. It was kind of honestly a cool connection to, that worked super well for this morning's topic of gratitude. But then Jesus goes on, he says, Jesus asks, we're, we're not all ten cleansed? Because it uh, says that they all, as they left, were cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, and your faith has made you well. You see, we see healing here, and this is physical, which I've experienced that. I've I've actually uh, told uh, sometime in the last year that Andrew and I, uh, being at SOS one time, and we prayed for this guy's back. He literally couldn't even stand up, and we prayed over him. We laid our hands on him, and he walked away standing up. I've seen people healed physically, but, but so that God does that too. And so maybe you've experienced healing. You've had experience of other people experiencing. By the way, we're seeing a lot of healing in our church of cancer, by the way. We should be praying more for that. And so like, we, I'm just excited. Yeah, we can give, praise God for that. We're seeing all that stuff happen. So I've seen people physically healed. We should pray for healing because God's a healer. But then I thought about not just physical healing. I'm thinking about when, when, when there's a relationship that's broken and it doesn't look like it's even possible to reconcile and God shows up and he heals the relationship. Heals the marriage. Or I thought about like, uh, it, like emotionally when, when somebody from, uh, is, is healed of addiction or depression. Like God is a healer like emotionally, relationally, physically, financially, spiritually. And so God, it, we, we should be grateful that God is attentive to us as human beings. He is mindful of us to heal us, to heal our lives. Gosh, something to be grateful for. And then finally, uh, the last thing I thought about God's attention that we can be grateful for, and I'll just say it this way, is gratitude for freedom. I think that last one, yeah, gratitude for freedom. And, and, and this actually, uh, I would, it, was gonna, it was a little hard to kind of come up with a one word kind of thing, but what I mean by this is that, is that the fact that there is a tension on my sin and your sin there's a tension on our sin, and, God, and, and not only that like, there's a tension to it, but there's actually a way to get freed from our sin. It is an incredible gift of God, amen? I actually thought about the story then in uh, the woman at the well in John chapter 4, where Jesus tells this woman at the well, he says, he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, the water in the well, but whoever drinks the water I give them, Jesus says, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to them, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true and it's interesting as we look at the story that jesus here in this moment he actually calls her out now he's doing it lovingly but he calls her out and how she's living and really uh, against god's what god would desire for her but th- that's not even the wild part that jesus would do that because how many of that would be socially awkward the wild part of the story is that is that she is grateful that her mess and her sin are revealed actually goes on in verse 28 it says then leaving her jar a uh, water jar the woman went back to the town and said to the people come and and see a man who told me everything i ever did she's like hey come with me and he'll tell you every secret you have ever had it's gonna be great 
How many of you know that is a wild part of the story? And the reason why she's so excited is because she, her, her sin is called out, but not only because it's called out, because she actually has a possibility of freedom in her soul. This is the gospel. This is the what we should be so, I'm, I'm yelling at you, I'm sorry. I get passionate about Jesus. Folks, it is an incredible gift that God would send Jesus to die on a cross and, and bear my sin, your sin, the things that you are going to say and do that are going to be against God. Jesus took it on himself. An incredible gift. And that we can experience freedom though he experienced pain. Through salvation in Jesus Christ, we actually have been given freedom. And man, we should be grateful. Like Noah, folks, who, by the way, was the only, him and his family were the only ones spared, we ought to be grateful. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God made a way for us to experience freedom, even though, as I already mentioned, he knew we were going to continue to mess up, and yet he sent Jesus anyways. What a loving God we have. Talk about gratitude. Talk about God's attention. Whew. Look, Noah's altar teaches us to be grateful for this attention. And Noah, in this moment, he realized all that God had done, again, over his whole life in this 371 days. So he builds an altar of gratitude and thankfulness. And I think that one of the things that we can take from this today is that we ought to do the same. We ought to be thankful to a God sees us and has made a way for us. So today, I think it's a great day to 